Hello, Bruins fans, and welcome back to the Black and Gold Hockey Podcast, a weekly discussion about the National Hockey League Boston Bruins from hosts and hockey writers Mark Allred and Dominic Tiano. Please uh, subscribe on audio platforms such as Apple Podcasts and Spotify and kindly consider giving us a five-star rating along with a written review. For the video version of this weekly podcast, please subscribe on our official YouTube channel by searching Black and Gold Productions LLC, and please click like and the notification bell to be alerted when we drop new Boston Bruins related content. Uh, if you'd like to get involved in the Bruins hockey talk, please send us a brief voicemail at 978-504-2727 or send us a question on Twitter using the hashtag AskBNG. Thanks for the continued support and enjoy the show. What's up, Bruins fans? Welcome back to the Black and Gold Hockey Podcast. I'm your host, Mark Allred. That is Mr. Dom Tiano. And this is episode 354 brought to you by BB Lux Transportation Company. Please give them a call. If you need a ride in the greater Boston area to go see a show, uh, a sporting event, they have a van with up to 15 passengers. And they have some really nice cars, too. So if you need a ride, if you're out drinking, having a good time, and you want a safe and reliable ride home, please call 978 701 one four seven three. That is BB Lux, and look him up online. Uh, special guest today, Dom, uh, old friend oh, yeah. Mick Palagio, uh, and he is a longtime scribe up in the ninth floor, uh, and and one of the ambassadors to somebody like me. I'm never going to claim that I've been up there uh, on the ninth floor as a media member for every game. Uh, I get up there when I can, but we we our sports media company has had regular. Uh, visitors uh, through um, workstations up there. But I, I do want to say something about Mick is uh, what an ambassador to somebody like me or the younger folk uh, that are coming through uh, journalism and so on and covering the Boston Bruins. Uh, I went in as a, a 40 year old, 45, let's just say. And uh, Mick, uh, you took me uh, under your wing and showed me around and where to go, where the workstations were. So I continue to always think about that moment when I was introduced to you because you are, you are like a, a really good ambassador to a lot of people that uh, don't get up there regularly. So thank you very much. And, and Mick, uh, do me a favor, uh, please plug um, you know, what you got going on, where you're working, and obviously your, uh, your uh, Twitter account. Well, hey, thanks. Um, that, that's awfully nice of you to note. Um, uh, I go on, I write a weekly a Sunday column for bostonhockeynow.com. Um, so giving uh, Jim Murphy some support on that site. Uh, I'm seen on the Bruins chapters of the seasonal hockey news issues that do Future Watch for Prospects, the yearbook, which is a season preview, the money power. So that, that's, that's the limit of that. Um, and I have my own little rink wrap blog that I've revived as a solo thing. And for many years, it was a... Uh, a thing that I did through my former employer, the Standard Times in New Bedford, Mass., uh, which was my flagship for many years. Um, but uh, our association at this point is uh, so seldom um, that that uh, while I still have friends and I still support uh, them when I can, um, you know, it was time this year to to uh, to uh, re reconstitute my uh, my credential with the Bruins, and and they were very. Uh, supportive in that regard. So uh, that allows me a better platform to uh, get back into blogging on game nights. And, and um, you know, it, it's just, it's just, I'm doing more this year than I had in, in the last few years because of how things were going in the newspaper world. So uh, pretty excited about that. Um, and uh, it's been a pretty involved season for me. Uh, and thanks for having me on because the podcasting part of it's fun for me because I originally began uh, with broadcasting aspirations. I wanted to be the next Bob Wilson. And, uh, ah, Bobby. <laughs> and yeah, I mean, and, and you know that that uh, that the stewardship of that great tradition rightfully went to Dave Gosher. Uh, but but I um, uh, I started out and I, I you know Bob Wilson liked my tape, Dave Shea liked my tape. I got advice from Tom Larson, who used to be the uh, intermission host on TV 38 and later Nesson. Um, and and uh, it just turned out that newspaper was a better home for me for various reasons. And you find out along the way in your journey that, that you're good at something or that you find greater fulfillment in it than you could have ever imagined. And so I'm really happy with how things turned out. 
Um, and I just want to add, for those people who don't know Mick, um, he's the most knowledgeable historian when it comes to the Boston Bruins that I know. And I know a lot of people. So uh, give that man below us a follow. Um, and if you ever want to know anything about the history of hockey, that's the man to ask because uh, he recalls it like an encyclopedia. <laughs> well, I have I do have a sweet spot like everybody does, right? You know, I mean, my yeah. first game my first game was the sixty seven sixty eight season, um, so I'm I'm pretty good in that era, and I got kind of obsessed with Boston Garden, its nuances and its design, and the Bruins uniform even. Um, and in in recent years, uh, my pal Kevin Votor, whom I mentioned earlier, uh, has hooked me up with other hist uh, hockey historians like himself. He is published. He came out with the Bruins book, a reference piece in the late 90s. And, um, but uh, through him, I've met a bunch of great guys who are uh, usually Canadians like yourself, Dom, and, yeah. and, uh, and, and really dig deep into some stuff that has really kind of opened my eyes and brought me a, a whole uh, new era of knowledge about what predates my era. And, right. I mean, every, every era likes to think they invented, you know, sex, drugs, and rock and roll. But it, it's it's <laughs> – it's funny how you find out a lot, you know, like I had no idea until later in life that Leo Labine 10 years before, you know, Terry O'Reilly was Terry O'Reilly to those Bruins yeah. and Rocket Richard, you know, I knew about him relative to say Guy Lafleur. We're going to make loose comparisons, but that late, late fifties Bruins team that's so overlooked and ignored in the scope of their history that there was so much there that if you could imagine and put yourself in in a time machine and go back and find yourself in a in an angry yelling Boston Garden in the middle of a playoff series like that and and realize that these people before Bobby Orr they had something there that was very special to them and and yeah. we and we and what we got stands on the shoulders of that and and uh, and so when I think of young fans now. I really have learned to really enjoy watching them go crazy over Pasternak, you know, fall yes. in love with Bergeron and, and, you know, whoever else they're, they're grabbing on to these days. Um, it's, it's been a lot of fun um, lo looking at them do, do that because that's really the experience and the buildings become special because the teams become special. And, right. um, and that's what I, I really enjoy. I never get sick of it. I never get sick of watching people get hooked on the Bruins I never get sick of watching the hockey myself. Um, you know, as journalists, we're not supposed to root. What a what a big fat lie that is. I mean, exactly. You want to see a bunch of crazy people? Go to a sports bar like when the Fours used to be open on Canal Street oh, after yes. a game, and watch some of these writers go crazy looking at the television about their teams, whatever city they're from, and what's going on. They're out of their minds. I mean, so. Yeah. This idea that we just sit back like a bunch of stodgy academics, it's just, you know, it's just yeah. nowhere near the truth. Uh, Mick, as somebody that knows the game, uh, in my eyes, pretty well and been around for a while, how important is this 100th year anniversary to you to cover this? And, and obviously, um, you were a part of the, uh, the uh, celebration to start off the season, correct, with the panel of writers? Oh, you mean the, uh, the committee? To, yes. to pick yeah. the 100, uh, yeah. and then they pick the all-time 20. Yes. Yeah. yeah I, I uh, you know, thanks to the Bruins for for uh, reaching out and and put me on that that group. Um, so yeah, that was it was it was great. It was uh, it was so much fun to see people pop out of the woodwork that I just you know sometimes it's never on your radar. You're thinking about certain people might show up, and then you see another face and it's like, wow, Andy Moog. You know, I, mean, I think the last yeah. time I saw Andy Moog was on the People's Court. You know, so the, the special episode where Judge Judge Whopper came out of retirement to yeah. to uh, to see uh, hear the case where where a guy signed got a <laughs> bought of what was purported to be an Andy Moog sweater, but he had signed the number and not the sweater itself, and was able to testify that no, they didn't doctor the sleeves on my jersey like they usually do. You didn't get the rubs of the red paint from the post. You didn't get the rips yeah. and the usually the repair marks, and so. A uh, disappointed consumer, but a uh, very uh, memorable episode of the People's Court. Uh, but, yeah, That's it was just fun seeing people I never thought I would see. That was probably the most fun. 
um, being part of the panel to judge. Um, and, and you know, I got to tell, I got to throw props out to the younger uh, core of uh, beat writers, uh, guys like uh, Ty Anderson and Connor Ryan, um, etc. There's uh, Scott McLaughlin. They, some of these guys did a great job. They do were so did so much hard research and made sure that they were fair in their treatment of the of the generations of the Bruins that preceded them, uh, which is a harder job for them than an older guy like me. Uh, yeah. So uh, that that was really gratifying to be part of a process where they gave it so much respect. And I knew everybody would do a good job. I only had one bone to pick with the entire thing. Um, and uh, given the performance of David Pasternak this season, uh, I can't complain too much about that either. I just feel like this season for him is actually greater than last year's season. Yeah. Even though in the books, a 61-goal season is the only one in the Bruins history besides the five that Phil Esposito did. But uh, this this uh, guy has become a, a much better uh leader, a much better puck manager at the end of shifts and at the end of periods. And, um, and he's, and he's, he's running around and he's hitting people and he's battling and he's, he's leading by example. And uh, he's really become a bona fide superstar worthy of that kind of conversation. Um, I thought last year it was too soon, uh, despite the, you know, the hot finish to the season and the 61 goal total, uh, whatever it was. Uh, but, but yeah, you know, I mean, I really wanted to see Lionel Hitchman on that team. As Dick Johnson, the uh, curator of the Boston Sports Museum, pointed out, uh, everybody talks about the Bruins culture. Lionel Hitchman gave it to them. And, yeah. and uh, without him, you don't have it. Or, you get, or it gets invented later. And, and maybe not the same way. Uh, so however you measure it, um, I really wanted to see Dick Clapper go in as a forward so that Lionel Hitchman would be the sixth defenseman. Instead, it was predetermined uh, that that uh, by a vote that Clapper would be considered more of a defenseman than a forward, and that knows out Lionel Hitchman and, if you were making the argument, Fernie Flamin. Um, uh, and then it opened the door for David Pasternak to be among that group of 12 forwards. So, uh, But overall, terrific job by the people involved. Um, you know, I can't believe I even voted against Jerry Cheevers, my all-time favorite player in any sport, any era any team um, of all time uh, because I felt that, you know, a tiny Thompson's accomplishments really belong there. And if not, then Tim Thomas is dead. Uh, and, but I was researching later just to kind of review. And one thing that I, I stumbled upon that I knew in general how good he was. I didn't realize how good, but Jerry Cheever's 1969 playoff, the year before they won the Stanley cup, the one that ended when John Beliveau broke my heart double overtime my dad let me stay up on a school night that playoff yeah. by Cheevers is the best statistical playoff in modern Bruins history I never would have guessed it <laughs> because he was known as the guy who didn't care if he won seven or six or three to two it just made sure he yeah. made one more save than the other guy and uh for the big games especially and um uh, and that that actually is the supreme uh Statistical playoff run by a Bruins goalie. Believe it or not, I'm Jerry not Chavis surprised. Team. Not I was surprised too. at all. <laughs> but I not Mick, surprised. I I'm sure everybody wants us to talk about the current Bruins, but I have to go back a little bit of history because I think even Mark is too young to really remember. Um the greatest player that ever played the game celebrated his 76th birthday last week. <laughs> yeah. Um, Boy, Bobby old. Orr. And I'm sure that the vast majority of people listening or watching never got the chance to see him play. I always say Gordy Howe made me a hockey fan. Bobby Orr made me a Bruins fan. <laughs> and of all the things you can take away from Bobby Orr, and and what he did as a hockey player. By the way, if you haven't watched it, watch an interview done here in Canada several years ago. It was with Peter Mansbridge and Bobby Orr. The most honest I've ever seen Bobby Orr speak. He even threw Alan Eagleson under the bus mm -hmm. on this oh. one. So it's on YouTube. Um Watch Peter Mansbridge interview with Bobby Orr. 
uh, and you'll be you'll love the interview. Anyway, with so many things to take away, you could take away from them. There's one thing that always stood out to me, Mick, is how humble he was. You very rarely saw him celebrate a goal. No, it was like a, a tap on the stick. Line up at the blue line and let's go. It's almost like we're saying, I don't know, I'm too good for this. I'm too good for this league. Or, you know, I I don't want to, you know, I don't want to show anybody up. And he right. was just so humble. Um, what's your biggest takeaway from Bobby Orr? If I could take a younger fan who doesn't understand that Tom Brady is not the biggest thing that's ever happened to this region and make him understand what it was like to be in junior high or high school and and everybody's mother was in love with either Bobby Orr or Derek Sanderson. And then my algebra teacher took out the – talked about the Bruins game for 10 minutes before we cracked the books. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it, awesome. it, that yeah. was just the life back then. Everybody wanted some sort of connection. Everybody wanted to try to get their hands on a ticket to a game. And I think when I think of actual relative to your straight on to your question is, is I, I think that unfortunately YouTube doesn't give us the full flavor. You see Bobby Not Orr skating all. around five Atlanta flames like their pylons. Um, and they look like they're just standing there. These guys are accomplished NHL players. That was a good hockey team. So Atlanta never did anything. Atlanta had a tough draw every year of the playoffs. They, if that city ever had any playoff success, I think that they'd still be there um, in either era. And and I think that one of the things that gets lost is what a fierce competitor Bobby Orr was. You can mm-hmm. somehow take a, one of some of these young people and put them at a Bruins game, and suddenly you're you're right there and you're watching, and it's and it's Bobby Orr. You'll never see a guy who fights harder on the ice to win, who competes harder. No, I mean, that equipment, those elbow pads, those shoulder pads, those hockey pants, and no helmet, and he goes down in front of Bobby Hull to block a shot with a game on the line. Um, It's just – it's a different era. Uh, People say, could those players play now? I asked the question: Can these could these players play then? You know, yeah, yeah. Sports move forward. We all know this. Everything moves forward. Medicine moves forward. Training moves forward. Nutrition moves forward. Equipment moves forward. So there are going to be coaching knowledge moves forward. Technology to use it moves forward. Video, uh, tablets on the bench. Um, it, it's always going to move forward. The sports going to move forward. You can't turn them back. But to say, to suggest that the DNA of that era could not compete with this DNA, to me, is ludicrous. And, and uh, do I think Sidney Crosby could step in and play in that league? Yeah, I think it'd be great. But I also think that Bob Ewer would step into this one, and it'd be great. And, and I think in my memory of Bob Ewer is the guy who, who, who fights in battles, and it might get nasty. And he's he's a lousy loser. Uh, he was a respectful yeah. loser. Uh, you know, I mean, his story about his buddy Joe Watson, with whom they broke in with the Bruins in '66. Uh, you know, inviting him into the Flyers' room when he went over there to seek him out to congratulate him after the '74 Stanley Cup. Uh, I think that's a great story. You know that that you know that Joe just was talking about a great guy he is and how please come in and. And never drink with us. And and Orr's like, no, no, no. This is you guys. You guys deserve to win. And and he goes, I mean, that was. And then the then the bus is driving away from the Spectrum that Sunday afternoon, and and there was some uh, some unruly fans who are probably over overly lubricated. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if they were throwing things at the bus or what they were yelling. But guess who got up in the bus and started walking to get out of the bus before they held them back. You know, so I mean, uh, yeah, it, it just—it just was. Uh, you got to understand him as such a fierce competitor in order to cont- properly contextualize his enormous t- 
talent. That that to me is what really what really made him special in that position as a defenseman who broke all the rules of how you play the position. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, uh, you know, old Star Wars like Stan Fischler are never gonna like a guy who ran over the Rangers twice and who and who uh, uh, you know uh, did all these things Doug Harvey would never think of doing, but he did it to win. He didn't do it so that he'd be a great individual player or get right. making the all-star team. He did it to win. It's kind of like Patrice Bergeron's one-timer. Why did, why did Patrice Bergeron in his thirties develop a one-timer from the circle? Because he looked around, he realized that nobody else had one. And he figured that if we're going to score more power play goals, if we're going to win, I have to work on this. I have to go do it. Suddenly he has a one-timer and he's that guy until pasta comes along and, sort of renders him, uh, you know, for his next reinvention, which wound up becoming uh, what they like to call the bumper, you know, became the metal arc lemon of the Bruins. And, uh, yeah. in, you know, that's, that's, that's guys reinvent themselves the best way they can in order to win uh, because they embrace it. Zanano Chara, even though he's considered so such an athletic freak that he, that he's, not really considered as an improviser. For him, that's always the way it was. I remember asking him about the bad ice one night and how do you play this game? He says, look, he said, you have to accept immediately. This is what you have. And then just put away every other thought you have about, no, the ice should be good. It should be able to, don't fight with it. This is exactly what we have. And now this is the game. This is what you do. This is how you win. This is how you have to compete. You accept it. And you go, and this is everybody's deal. And the sooner you accept it, the better off you are. And and I'm um, thinking, like, and it really started getting into my head how he plays the game, how he negotiates the contest, and and how he thinks it, and all the different ways that he had to improve himself as a player, including trying not to do too much uh, in order to be at his best service to the Bruins and what they were trying to develop. Um, and you know, and he was able to do that with once Claude was there to give him some of that kind of guidance. And um, and take some of that pressure off of him, um, and he you know became the beast that you know wrote his legacy. So uh, when I think of or I think of compete. That's what I think of. I think it just that the videos show not do justice to how hard he played. Yeah, and uh, unfortunately, that's that's where um, my generation is. I was born in '75, so I missed I missed the Bobby Orr days of going to the Garden and so on, but. Uh, you know, fortunate to have those videos on YouTube and so on. But you're you're absolutely right. It, those those particular games, they just showed him skating through like Swiss cheese. You know, and they're playing music. Um, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and the goalies exactly. look like they're just standing there, like coaches who aren't really interested in st- yeah. stopping the puck, but happen to be wearing the equipment. Exactly. And but that was the style back then too. Stand up goaltenders weren't on the realm. You know, they were right. everywhere. It was Tony. Now, it was Tony as in style. my opinion. Yeah. It was Tony Esposito, in my opinion, that came out with like that that hybrid type of. Uh, He's motherboard. the one you remember, yeah. I think yeah, that, that's yeah. what I'm, I am too. But technically, it's Glenn Hall. I think Crozier uh-huh. was considered that way. But Tony Esposito is the guy who, for me, was emblematic of that era and that that playing style. Uh, in a time when it wasn't a thing, and it wouldn't be for many years until until really the Patrick Waugh era really kind of changed it for everyone. Yeah. Uh, why don't we uh, hit a commercial break, and we'll kind of talk about um, some things about uh, this year's team and w- and where we're going with, like, uh, under 10 games to go in the regular season. So let's hear from our uh, show sponsor, BB Lux. We'll be right back on the other side. If you're looking for a safe and reliable ride to the airport or planning a trip to Boston for a sporting event for groups of up to 15 people, we highly recommend the BB Lux Transportation Company. This five-star family-run business is the number one private car service of the UMass and Hearst Parent Group and is dedicated to making sure you have the best traveling experience for any occasion, whether your trip is for business or pleasure. Please call BB Lux today at 978701. 1473 to schedule your ride to and from anywhere in the greater Boston area. You can also send this transportation company an email at bbluxforless at gmail.com. Please give them a follow on Facebook 
by searching BB Lux and tell them Black and Gold Productions sent you. All right, we are back. Thank you, BB Lux, for sponsoring this program. Um, looks like Denver has won it in overtime, but totally not sure. It look, looks like there could be goaltender interference. Oh, great. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we'll, know two, st- we'll know in two days what the judgment is. <laughs> exactly. I was gonna. I was going to celebrate, go, yeah, because I want Denver to win. And Mark comes up with that, so I'm glad I held back. <laughs> What's that mean for Locke Mellis, uh, Dom? Um, nothing, really. He'll be back there next next year, and, uh, you know, um, I expect hit next year will be his breakout year, just like this year was for Oscar Yelvick. Ah. You know, a year of, of transitioning and getting used to the North American game. Are there any other college players that you um, – I'm sorry, Mark, I'm kind of hijacking the podcast here. It's, it's uh, okay. It's okay. Right. No worries. <laughs> uh, so, like Dom, it. do you see any other college uh, Bruins prospects uh, playing college hockey right now who might do like Riley D- Duran and sign and do the ATO? Um, no. Uh, the, the, like Mark and I are really, really high on Duran and happy that – that he's decided to turn pro. Um, his first great game was kind of iffy, you know, getting different pace and, uh, and you, you know what it's like, Mick. Um, the, the only possible one that could sign is Quinn Olson just finished his graduation or grad year. So um, he has to sign by August 15th or becomes a UFA. He's he's like a Carson Kuhlman uh, okay. type player. A, a lot of similarities to Car- to Carson Kuhlman. And now, whether the Bruins offer him a contract or no, not, I don't know. Um, I'm leading towards they don't. Um, but other than that, I. I I don't see Jake Schmaltz deciding to turn pro. Uh, he didn't have a very good year. Other than that, everybody's got to go back. Yeah. Statistically, Duran didn't either. I mean, the Friars were <coughs> as good as they'd been, and, and his season was really down statistically. I think he played more wing this year. And, uh, yeah. Than, than, he than played, his center position he, that they had him in before. He played almost entirely on the on the right wing. But – you know, he was top line too, Mick, so he should have gotten more points than he did. But he's not a point producer. It's everything else he brings in the game. I didn't see the game in its entirety from, uh, what was it now, Wednesday night, Mark? Yes. I'm sure you've watched the whole thing. Um, like the bits and pieces I saw, I didn't see anything stand out. Uh, but no, I mean, nothing, nothing stood out to me at all, but it was just more or less like those first, you know, the first experience jitters trying to get used to a yeah. new system and so on, you know, going from Nate Lehman to Ryan Mujanel system. It, it, it is a, it, it's, it's a bit of a learning curve and so on, but I'm pretty sure with the remaining games, if he, if he gets into them, um, he'll get him a, lo- a lot more comfortable and so on. I I'm looking forward to him like getting on a line with, with Trevor Kunta because I think that, oh, yeah. that, that I think that line will just cause chaos. You know? <laughs> we you know, we talked about it last week, uh, Mick, that a future line of, you know, in a couple of years of Trevor Kuntar, Riley Duran, and Johnny Beecher in the middle, mm-hmm. that's gonna be a an awesome line for the Bruins. Absolutely. But uh, yeah, you know, I, I I like Kuntar. He plays with people, a bit of spice. Yeah, but, you know, people expecting big point production out of Duran are going to be disappointed. I say to people, uh, level off your expectations and you'll be happy with him because he brings a lot to the game. Well, I think that'll, I think from day one, from when they drafted him, they were talking about him as a, as a projecting him as a uh, bottom six a grinder who yeah. could be a uh, disruptor and a, a guy who puts some hard skills into the game that uh, that really um, 
uh, elevate your team playoff time, especially. Um, yeah. And that, and hey, you know, I mean, a few guys like that now in the system, and and let's see how he does as a pro. It sounds to me like that's been the idea, the concept that he would make a good pro. Um, guys, that's how it works. So let's see what he's yeah. got. You know, it'll take time, and, and it'll be fun to see him run the gauntlet against all of these uh, grizzled AHLers who want to make him regret the decision. Yeah, talk, let's talk about this this year, Mick. Um, as I said uh, to start the program, yeah, you've been covering the team for a while, and and um, what what do you what do you get out of this year? We know we all know it was a transition year by losing Bergeron and losing Krejci, but what were some of the bigger points coming down to the end of the year that you find more intriguing? And 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 out of those points, where do you see this team? gravitating to in a cup run I, I i'm i've been saying i don't believe this is the the roster to go for a cup but anything could happen i think the legacy of bruins playoff failures of the last uh of the don sweeney era has been that they don't get inside ice on the offensive end and they concede it too easily on the defensive end and i feel like those are the main things that if they thought they could address them um I mean, does anybody think Jake DeBrusque is coming back to Boston? He's going to I mean, have, I've have never a great, great playoff year. I've never seen it. I've never seen a guy this young in his career go UFA, not get signed, and then and then do the extension with the team instead right. of going to market. If he goes to market, bye bye. You know, so uh, I don't I don't see it. So why is he still here? That's, you know, and so now I, I've heard that maybe, they, you know, that they tried to uh, bring Hannafin here and tried to inject DeBrusque in that conversation. That obviously wasn't going to get it done, but if they weren't willing to sweeten it because they didn't want a chance losing prospects when they already don't have picks, um, to me it's like, okay, fine, but you're not going to get what you really need, which is a left shot physical defenseman to ease the game for Charlie McAvoy. Not that Hannafin is a Radko Gudis banger, but he's an all-purpose guy who does everything well. And, and now he's going to go to Vegas, and he's probably going to succeed Martinez in that role and extend with them. And they're going to have the guy, and they're the team that had no cap wiggle until Mark Stone had his situation. So uh, it looks like that's gone. It looks like that window is going to be gone. So... Uh, all of the thing about, oh, let's wait, we'll have so much more flexibility during the summer. Well, if your target player is right there, and if you know certain guys aren't going to play for you next year, and if you know you can't win with what you got, and I think that's the X factor here because they think they can win, win with what they got because they have a good feeling in their room. They When they compete really hard, they cross this subtle little threshold that uh, of effort and tenacity and meanness maybe even where they all of a sudden become a much more effective playoff-style hockey team. We saw it against Florida the other uh, uh, two nights ago. Uh, Tampa, they tried to replicate it. It wasn't there on successive nights, in my opinion, because it's not their DNA. It's a roster issue. It's not an attitude, in my opinion. It's not, I don't think, and it's not that I got a, uh, it's not like I got a, my, a bullseye on anybody's back. It's that they don't have enough of what, it takes to pressure the forecheck to make defensemen opposing defensemen in a playoff series, go back for puck retrievals and be distracted with all this skill and speed that they had last year. Brandon Montour still looked like game one first period and with one minute left in the series and needing to make a great play to tie it up. And he did it. And he should have been hobbling his way up the ice. If that was the 2011 Bruins, he yeah. would have been on one leg, and and uh, and unfortunately, that's that's uh, the legacy of the playoff fails. Um, they obviously left something on the table last year. How it unfolded with the goaltending situation, we can look at a million different ways. The one that kills me the most is uh, Game Five, and not Marshan with the with the with the siren ready to go over his shoulder. To me, it was pasta two on one. Um, is the one guy in the team that you didn't worry about passing off a scoring chance, and he scores that goal, it's over. Instead, he passes to a covered player, and Florida still has life. 
And anytime you let the more physical team uh, extend a series, extend their life, and it gets down to the ultimate moments, the more physical team wins, just like the Bruins beat Vancouver, just like the Blues beat the Bruins, and just like uh, the Panthers and the Bruins. You take the foot off their throat, they're going to come back and get you. And that's what the, the legacy is of the playoffs. And to me, uh, have they shown that they can deny inside ice? Uh, they want Lindholm and Carlo to be that matchup pair. Well, what if you wind up playing Florida down the road here and they got two lines that can come at you that way? Uh, Barkov may well, be a peaceful a, sort, but he's a beast. So Yeah. And Mark, Mark and I have been harping on the exact same thing all season long. But you segued into something here, Mick. Mark has a video to, to tee up for you in a second to watch from the Florida game. I... I Kind of wonder about Florida because in the third period when the Bruins started giving it back to them, they kind of backed off. Florida did. But I want you to watch Matthew Kachuk's right leg here towards the end of the video. And then I've got a question for you. I've got a couple of questions for you. Uh, can you cue that up for Mick? You got it. It's towards the end, Mick. So what we're watching right now is just the, the game of uh, Parker Witherspoon and and uh, Matthew Kachuk. Kachuk obviously comes in with with a, a, a leg kind of kicking motion right there. Yeah. Did you see it, Mick? Yeah. Yep. So okay. do what, so I, I mean, I, I want to ask you a couple of questions about that, Mick, because I mean I've watched Matthew Kachuk all the way back to his days in the OHL. Do you think that was intentional or that was a follow through? And no. yes, you, <laughs> he did it. Okay, so we agree on that. Mark Mark agreed too. So yeah. now, it, watching that video, Danton Heinen comes up off the bench and skates towards center ice while all that shoving around was going on. Trent Frederick needed to be the guy on this roster to stand up afterwards at some point and say enough is enough. Uh, Hampus Lindholm shouldn't be going up against Sam Bennett. Oh. Um, you know, like, I, I was really, really disappointed in Frederick that game, and... I want to say if Pat Maroon was in the lineup or go back to Milan Lucic, if he was still around, um, that a lot of that crap would go answered for. And we're not seeing an answer. We talk, They often talk about standing up for each other, and when one goes into battle, they all go into war. And I'm not seeing it. I think that's a fair – I think that's a fair criticism. I think they – I think they talk a good game. Um, uh, I think that Freddie, I'm glad in the biggest of pictures that Freddie's not always thinking about his next fight, that he's trying to be a hockey player because he's a good hockey player. And, and I do think that on a team that's desperately needing a more physical presence amongst its skilled players to do hockey things with that toughness, that – Freddie is trending in a direction that may make him be that player someday. Uh, they've even experimented a little bit with him up there, a little bit with Geeky, you know, because he's got a kind of a, a swashbuckling kind of Wayne Cashman sort of messy looking style. It's not pretty, but the puck tends to follow him, right? So uh, now mm -hmm. back to your point about standing up and making people accountable. Hey, uh, when – the story about Chara and Lucic and I don't know if it was Johnny Boychuk, but whoever else was standing there, Adam McQuaid, going to the Vancouver bench early in period one of game three after Aaron Rome made a late hit on a blind uh, Nathan Horton, you know, he was looking at his pass and, and, uh, and he got hit late and, take, and knocked out. And, and they went to the bench and they said, you're not going to make it through this series. I mean, you're down two games. You need composure. And it might be the tendency of, uh, of most teams to cuddle amongst themselves 
and try to just calm everybody down and let's play hockey and let's, you know, did we really need this game? We'll deal with that later. So they went organic. They responded with emotion. They went there and said, you guys are not going to make – they threatened them. And then they, you know, they did it. They won. They backed and it up. They backed it up. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, when, uh, you took you took uh, the Bruins' most reasonable facsimile to Mark Messier off their team, the guy who could had easy speed and could really, you know, forecheck fear into opposing defensemen, even if he wasn't going to knock him into the seventh row the way Lucic would. He, he you know, more of that Glenn Murray mold where uh, because of the strength of the stride and the amount of uh, feet that he can take with one push and how he can generate that kind of uh, pressure on the forecheck, uh, Horton and, and obviously his skills, uh, really, and, and he was a tough guy. Uh, when he was angry, he could fight. Uh, that that was out of the Bruins lineup suddenly. That could have been like a, just sort of like, a, oh, everybody's head could go down. That could be the end of the series right there. Instead, it was a rallying point for that Bruins leadership. Uh, they believed, believed in playing straight through the hockey game, and, and they went at them. Now, okay, so let's go up to today. And spare me, please, everybody who ever says the game has changed, how come every single playoffs it didn't change as much for the opponent that knocked the Bruins out of the playoffs as it did for the Bruins? How come every single year that's, you know, it's Svechnikov running Lindholm, uh, it's it's uh, it's 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 Palmieri uh, going after McAvoy behind the net and literally trying to hurt him. And you have, I mean, Barry Trotz was so uh, impressed with how Charlie McAvoy stood up to the Islanders for six games. He gave. I remember watch looking down on the ice when they were in the handshake line, uh, and and how how uh, much. Uh, Actually, the game I was not there. It was actually on the island where they where they lost the series. But I remember watching on TV how Barry Trotz hugged Charlie McAvoy for so long. I thought he was going to stick him under his coat pocket and try to get him off the ice and put him in an island yeah. uniform for the next series. Lou, I got I got one. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. I mean, really, I mean, uh, that's how much he was impressed with how McAvoy stood up to them. Um, there was not enough of that throughout the lineup. Um, I think that, you know, in, in the most uh, hockey-specific terms, uh, the areas in front of each net, uh, that's the battleground that matters most, and that's the one that uh, the cheap shot stuff, if that stuff gets ignored and played through and everything else, I'm a lot, I'm a lot more accepting of that than I am of, of what happens in front of each net because that's what's going to decide the series. Now, and I don't believe in a strict dichotomy – between toughness and winning hockey. I don't consider toughness a necessary evil that allows skilled teams to win hockey games. It's part of the game. It's it's an organically uh, intrinsic part of hockey. Hockey is an intimidating sport at its gut level and its raw level, and that's why everybody, even the three-sport media, likes watching the Stanley Cup playoffs because it has a certain thing about it that people are like, you know, I remember, I remember on social a few years back when um, someone, apparently a famous uh, uh, a musical artist, I think a rapper, um, was quoted as saying something like, white people have been hiding hockey from us all these years. Uh, <laughs> this, this blank uh, is, is uh, on fire, bro. You know, and it's like next thing you know, all the hockey writers who knew who this guy was I like tweeting the crap out of it, and uh, it's like, hey, somebody, somebody noticed how great hockey is, you know. Um, it's, it's, uh, everybody feels that way about the playoffs, and they want to ignore it the rest of the year, and that's fine. I don't care. People watch whatever they want. I'm not. I don't mm -hmm. need to shepherd people to the sport of hockey. If they, if I can share it with somebody in my personal life and and make them a fan because I expose them to it somehow, uh, and they got to see it and and, and grasp onto it and. Uh, you know, and become a Bergeron fan or a Tuca fan or whatever era we're in, um, then that's a very gratifying feeling that they, you know, got on board and enjoyed it and made it part of their life. Uh, this this thing with the media and sports radio and ignoring hockey and 
uh, or Christian Fourier who used to play for the Patriots on EEI recently, and being annoyed at the at the at this uh, doctrine that the Stanley Cup playoffs are the greatest playoffs at all. I could care less if he thinks that. I don't need him to think that. I already know what I think, you know. And I enjoy. Yeah. I, hey, when the Boston Celtics are still playing, if they're still playing in June, if they don't screw it up, I'm going to enjoy watching them go after it. I was crazy about every sport when I was a kid, but the Bruins are the ones who held me the longest and shook me the hardest. And I never got sick of the game of hockey. Sometimes I'll go into a rink when I know there's a big playoff game going to happen, and there's nobody else in that rink, and I'm looking down at that tiny little ice surface and those two empty nets and just thinking, holy crap, I can't believe what's going to, what's going to happen here in about an hour or maybe two hours. It's going to be nuts, you know, and, uh, and, and it usually is. And, and that's, a, that's, a, that's just a great uh, feeling to anticipate, knowing what, what's there in store for us, because this game, at its emotional peak, is really spectacular. Uh, I think uh, I, will, I'm, I like the Bruins. I like the guys in the room. I enjoy interacting with them. They're great people. Um, I root for them. I want them all to have success. Um, but all these years... Um, of seeing how series are won and series are lost. Uh, they haven't shown me, even in these, even like you beat Florida the other night in their building, and yeah, and you're right, Dom. Uh, and Ty Anderson pointed this out as well when he was talking on the Bruins flagship 98.5, um, either today or the day before, that, that the Panthers, uh, when they saw that the Bruins weren't going to back down, they weren't, they weren't as interested in, continuing to try to bully them out of the rink. Uh, they they kind of settled down and played. But let's remember, this is a regular season game, and that's the Panthers game every night. So so trying to judge them as though they're some sort of paper tiger, uh, you know, and maybe this would go back to how they got manhandled by the Vegas Golden Knights last year. Let's not forget the NHL made them wait 10 days to play that series. It was just like yeah, the Bruins in 2019. It was, it, it was, it was just a, the way – uh, television uh, and the money seduces the NHL into these grotesque decisions to allow uh, the competitive balance of of, uh, of the game to be thrown off that way is really is really upsetting to me. I think it's it just ruins what should have been a great final. That should have been a series. Yeah. Instead, Florida forfeited two games before they even had a chance to figure out what the heck are we doing out here. Now they're down right. two games. And then, then you get yourself a series, and they won one, they lost one, and they went back and they lost, and that was it. Um, and sure, that Kachuk getting getting hit in that series uh, by Colasar, I think uh, that that uh, certainly helped uh, Vegas end it sooner. Uh, good for Vegas; they they didn't uh, they weren't the least bit intimidated. They played their game, um, and they were better at theirs than Florida was at theirs. And the hockey team itself isn't going to make any excuses, uh, but um, us media pundits, we can do it. You know, and, and I'm going to say that that I'm not saying they would have won. I'm just saying that that uh, that series was a lousy series and it could have been a good one. And I, that really that was really uh, disappointing to me. I think well, the it, NHL would have learned after what the Bruins did five years ago. If you ask Mark about that, we could do a whole podcast on on 10 days off. Right, Mark? <laughs> oh, my God, it's crazy, <laughs> crazy. It's almost like what the AHL does, and I, I hate the AHL's p- playoff format. It's just so dumb. Like three, three games in the first round, best of three, a best of five, a best of five. Your only seven game series is the final. That's ridiculous. Money, I guess. And, and right? also, yeah, but when you when when the AHL is is derived by asses in the seats, while well, a lot of these organizations are are, are you know. <laughs> Running off of that, yeah. there's nobody there in the first place. But you know, you it. I don't know. It just doesn't. Maybe the world. NHL. Maybe the NHL should um should uh you know better support that league then um, because uh, that's what the I NHL would. always brag. The NHL always makes note of the fact that three quarters of the NHL played in that league, and it's true. Yeah. So, yeah. so last, last why not year, giving these last... these important these important games in their development? Yeah. Last year, uh, Providence Bruins, 12 days off waiting for the Hartford Wolfpack to be done with their first round because because the Providence Bruins won the Atlantic Division. They yeah. got the first week by. Yeah, you were punished. Team. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's like how much can Ryan Mujanel, how much can Matt Thomas, and how much can Trent Whitfield get these guys going and just practice, practice, practice 
and be ready for game time. They yeah. were they weren't even ready for a well oiled machine in Hartford when they came in and just kind of just took it in three. Sad. So, too bad. Yeah. Too bad. I tell you, I feel like these decisions that are that are trumping um, what goes on throughout the culture of the sport that forms the basis of the season. And then at the end, it's like, okay, we built this beautiful house and now we're going to paint it with purple polka dots, you know, it's yeah. like, <laughs> and make sure that people keep on driving. If they were going to come, come and look and maybe buy it. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's, it doesn't make any sense to me. It's, it's, they gotta, they gotta do a better job of preserving, um, what is, what is a great thing and make sure it build, keeps building up instead of coming apart and just allowing your smoke and mirrors and your talking heads on, on network TV telling you how great it is to hockey fans are not stupid. And this is what annoys me is that they're held in contempt so often. It's kind of like, it's kind of like getting a cable subscription or, or if you're a streamer, you know, you could, uh, Hey, we have, um, uh, uh, YouTube TV at home. Okay, YouTube TV doesn't have Nesson, so I buy Nesson 360, 30 bucks a month, right? So they want me to give me incentive by giving me a free month, so it only costs me 11 months to buy 12. Well, I only need seven. I, I wouldn't mind going to a Red Sox game, but my life is, isn't such that I will wind up watching them on TV with enough regularity to justify continuing it throughout the, the whole year. I don't make, I don't earn that much money, so I, so I do that. I buy ESPN so I can get that odd game and then watch some out-of-towners while I'm at it. And they wind up still dragging you out all the way through so that you could be coming at this from the cable platform, from the streaming platform, and no matter what you do, there's no one button you can push, make a full commitment to the league, and and still get your get every single game. They still are going to force you somewhere else and make another purchase. I'm thinking like, we are, as consumers, we are the benefactors of their their ability to earn these millions of dollars and by doing these deals with the networks they are laughing in our faces and telling us you know you're gonna you're just gonna give it to us anyway uh and but, but he, this is a, this is a great conversation because now you're hitting in my wheelhouse on something that i wrote a couple of months ago um the nhl each individual nhl team should be in charge of their own streaming service that way, you do not block any service. doesn't matter where you are in the world. Your game will not be blocked. And that way, each individual franchise can earn the money that, like, Nesson is getting. And I understand that the, uh, the Boston Bruins own 20% of Nesson. That's fine. But if they want to reap all the benefits and keep all of their fans happy on a worldwide scope, individual team streams need to happen sooner or later. Well, maybe that's I, the I'm gonna, I'm, gonna, gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna make you jealous, both of you, because you're both in the great US of A. So I could get NHL Center Ice for thirty. I think it's thirty six ninety nine a month. Okay, but for forty three ninety nine a month, and I'm not a baseball fan. I'm not a basketball fan, but for forty three ninety nine a month, I get NHL Center Ice. I get the OHL action pack, so I get all the all the OHL games. Wow. I get NBA pass, so I can watch any basketball game I want. I get NCAA football and basketball, any game, any night. And uh, I get Major League Baseball, every mm -hmm. game, wow. for $43 That's a month. That's crazy. That's the, and, and no and no blackouts, no blackouts, <laughs> no blackouts. Unreal. <laughs> if they're blacked out, they're on Sportsnet anyway. So that's the only the only reason they're blacked out. Okay. They're either on right. Sportsnet or TSN. Yeah. Okay. Forty three forty three bucks a month. Jesus, with all that money you're saving, you should come down to Boston. Uh, I know the name like that. You should be able to walk into the North End and eat for free. Well, yeah, I should exactly. be able to, right? <laughs> <laughs> I should. Uh, all right, right, well, I'm just going to go marks for for some smork, some smork, some smoked brisket or something. That's Ooh. oh, that's happening. Yeah. That's happening yeah, sometime see? next week. He puts the, those uh, pictures up. 
he puts those pictures up on Twitter. I go, God, I wish I was there. <laughs> <laughs> you can smell it. Oh, yeah, you can exactly. smell it through the computer screen. Uh, anyway, we're, we're at about an hour and, uh, I got some things I got to do to, uh, get this edited, get it out before tomorrow morning, before I go to work at 4 a.m. So, uh, Mick Collagio, I want to th- say thank you very much for the time today. Um, the, the history, the knowledge, talking about the team. I think we, I think we had a nice little discussion about a, a, a various amount of things when it comes to the Boston Bruins organization. And obviously, Dom is uh, by my side every week. Um, but uh, thank you for the time, Mick. I really appreciate it. And hope to see you soon up on Level 9. Uh, hopefully, we can get access for a, for a playoff uh, series. So that would be nice. Let's hope so. Let's hope so. I mean, what, what the greatest thing could uh, make me feel foolish and go on a big <laughs> run here. <laughs> well, one, one last quick question, Mick. Very quick. Do you want the leaps in the first round or no? No, I don't. I'm an I'm an in minority there. I'm not laughing at the Leafs. Um, I do feel like Labushkin should help them, and I feel like that team is sick of losing. I don't think getting a win over Tampa last year gets it out of their system entirely. I think there's just too much skill there, and 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 I don't I don't want that series. I really don't. And and um, I, I'm, right now, all these opponents look really tough. So you can yeah. measure it a lot of different ways and say, well, here's why you don't want Tampa. Here's why you don't. Well, you're not going to get Florida. We know that. But, um, you know, there's a, there's a lot of scenarios here where it's, yeah, okay, I want the Capitals. That's the team I want. Yeah, I mean, the Capitals used to be the nemesis. Now they're not. So so that's – but right now I'd say the teams you want are outnumbered by the teams you don't when we ask it in that context that I think you are. Uh, but in terms of Toronto, um, I'm not ready to proclaim that this is going to be their year. Um, I think I jumped the gun a couple of years ago and thought that they were ready to do something big. Um, I was dead wrong. Um, I'm, I'm, you know, you know how it is, Dom. The older you get, the less you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm finding that out for sure. <laughs> I'm getting in myself. <laughs> we tell ourselves it's because I can see the size of the mountain. Finally, I know how big it is, so I know I don't yeah. try to talk about it. Uh, but exactly. the reality is, is that. Uh, is that you know? Hey, it's a 32-team league. I'm not. I don't subscribe to that idea that anybody can win the Stanley Cup when you spin the bottle. I, I think that this is um, uh, that, that you have a certain structure that you need to have foundational aspects to your roster that you need to have in place. Um, I'm a big believer that you either have a Crosby, Malkin, Bergeron, Krejci, uh, or you have a big three on defense. Uh, and if you have these pillars in place, now you get into all these other mitigating factors, tangible and intangible, that you can talk about uh, to decide whether or not. And and if you look through the – and I'm actually writing a, this um, epic on this right now. <laughs> I don't have a better word right now. But I'm writing this lengthy piece right now where I'm going through all the uh, the cup era uh, – the cap era champions and why then none of them are flukes. And and uh, and in almost all cases, they get validated through another appearance in the final within three seasons before or after. So uh, the idea that the playoffs start, nobody knows what's going to happen. It's just this mosh pit of craziness and somebody wins, um, usually a hot goalie. Uh, these things appear to be happening. There's there's a there's only certain teams that are, that are capable of this. And and uh, and they're almost always near the top of the league. The President's Trophy, yeah, sure. It's only happened twice in the cap era. But how many teams in the top four finishers in the President's Trophy chase have won it in the cap era? More than half the time. So wow. the idea that regular season pursuit of excellence is somehow detrimental to the playoffs, that might have been true for the Islanders in the early 80s when 16 of 21 teams made the playoffs. Yeah. But, and I realize, Mark, I'm about to take you. We're in the final minute before we hit 60. So I'm going to shut up now, and thank you for having me on. <laughs> No problem at all. Uh, th- thank, thank you very much, Dom. I appreciate it, and and Mick as well. Uh, we're gonna have to have you on again soon. Um, but I want to thank everybody for the um, the subscriptions, the the shares, the likes, the retweets, whatever you want to call it. We truly appreciate the the support and the interaction online. Um, we get some live streams coming up too. So uh, just be patient with us. They're coming. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we're working on some things right now. But anyway, uh, I'm your host, Mark Allred. That's Dom Tiano, and that's Mr. Uh, Mick Collagio. Thanks again, Mick. Take care, everybody. Have a great week. 
and go Bruins. All right. That's the end of this week's episode of the Black and Gold Hockey Podcast. We would greatly appreciate it if you give our Boston Bruins Hockey Talk a five-star rating and kindly give the program a written review. Please subscribe on worldwide listening platforms such as Apple Podcasts, Spotify Podcasts, Google Podcasts, iHeartRadio, and so on. Again, uh, we provide a video version of this weekly Bruins Talk, so please find our official YouTube channel by searching Black and Gold Productions LLC and hit the subscribe button and notifications bell to be notified when we drop updated Boston Bruins related content. Don't forget to interact with us by calling our listener hotline at 978-504-2727 or send us a tweet by using the hashtag AskBNG. Anyway, thanks again for the continued support and we'll be back next week for more Bruins insight and opinions. Or go Bruins. Bruins.